This is a technique we actually see in a treatise I teach from, which dates to 1410. This was choreographed by somebody who understands how fighting should work or should look. I absolutely loved it. Hi, I'm Matt Easton of Scholar Gladiatura and I teach people how to sword fight and use weapons from history. I'm also a YouTuber and an antique weapons dealer. And today I'm going to be looking at some of the fight scenes in Witcher Season 1 and Season 2. So just one interesting thing, the way that the witch is carrying his sword, um, so he's holding it sort of behind his shoulder, and this is actually quite a nice uh, detail about how to conceal a weapon, and it's something that we see in kind of prison shanking contexts and stuff like this, but I really like the detail of the fact that he's holding the sword hidden in that way. So at this point, he's going to be sizing up the number of opponents, where they're spread out, the surroundings. I've noticed that one of the guys is left-handed, you can tell from the side that he's wearing the sword on, and these are all of the sorts of things that he's going to be taking in and memorising ready for what's about to happen. So his immediate concern is obviously going to be those crossbows pointed at him and he's going to be thinking about how to get out of the way of those shots. They're probably not going to have time to reload before he closes distance, hopefully. That's one of the principal first things he's going to be looking at is how to deal with those crossbow bolts coming his way. Okay, so a little brutal detail there. He, he does a nice move. He does what we call a, a rabat or a beat. He deflects the blow off to the side and stabs the guy in what we call half sorting. So any time that you grip or support the blade up the blade, we call it half sorting, which is often used in armoured fighting, but also assists leverage and directing the point a bit more accurately. And of course, it enables you to thrust at closer range than you'd be able to do if you're holding the sword conventionally. The way he rips the sword out of the person's cheek or skull is a little bit dubious. I'm not sure that you could extract a blade out of someone's head quite that way but anyway it looks dramatic so one of the first things we have to note of course is when he goes into the exchange he's holding the sword upside down uh, reversed blade and this is something which uh, a lot of people who practice swordsmanship really hate actually when they sit in movies it's in the last few years we've seen it in tons and tons of different genres and it's something that uh, choreographers have really fallen in love with I think however in this particular context he actually uses it in an okay way mostly deflecting upwards and then coming in at very very close range to deliver slashes for the most part and occasionally using to stab and then finally we see he throws the sword and we have to mention that throwing the sword is not something you only see in movies it's absolutely something you see in historical fighting systems and we find in the 15th 16th century 17th century treatises using swords so it was something that actually fencing masters did teach in very specific situations to throw a sword obviously you disarm yourself but it does mean you can reach someone from further away So we see that he disarmed someone and he's got a gladius-like weapon in his left hand now and he's using that as a, we would say, an offhand weapon in conjunction with the main weapon and, and the secret here is to use the two weapons for different things. So one, while one is occupying the opponent's weapon, we try to use our own weapon to offend them. So essentially one defends, one offends, but you can switch which one's defending, which one's offending. If we cross swords, I won't be able to stop. This guard position she adopts, resting her own sword across her left arm, is, is, is pretty odd, I have to say. Uh, now, I don't necessarily have a problem with that, you know, this is a fantasy world, but it's not really very similar to uh, most of the guard positions that we adopt in, in fencing, especially with such a short sword as she's got. Now, there are positions where you look along the blade and hold it up to the side of the head here, which we find in European uh, treatises in German known as, uh, as ox, or in Italian, posta di finestra, but resting it on the arm quite like that. I know there's something similar in Japanese martial arts, but it's just a little bit odd with such a short sword. So lots and lots of spinning, like round and round and round. Um, and, you know, generally speaking, turning your back on the opponent is not a good idea. But I have to add the caveat. Lots of people online have criticized spinning in, in uh, movie fights. But we do actually find it in historical treatises occasionally within very specific situations. Now, I would say I wouldn't say that this qualifies. I wouldn't say this really does meet those criteria. But there are absolutely techniques where you do pirouette and turn around. But as I say, in very specific situations. And again, she's doing this with really quite a short sword. Usually a short sword like this would be used obviously at close range or with a shield or whatever. But you know, she's making the most of the weapon that she's got. <laughs> 
So it has to be said that, you know, the Witcher there himself is spinning around and he's got a longer weapon than her and it's also got a two-handed grip on it. And he's actually kind of fighting at her distance, which is probably not the best thing to do uh, because he's allowing her to be on an equal footing. Now, understandably, he might not just be, in the context of this scene, just aiming to just kill her outright. But certainly within a, a fight, if he was aiming to win and stay alive, if he didn't have much superior skills to her as a, his opponent, then the distance he's chosen to fight at would be disadvantageous advantageous for the weapon that he's using. He should be fighting at a wider distance where he's forcing the person with the shorter weapon to be at a disadvantage. <laughs> so I've got to admit, okay, that that is a, a really, really nice move blocking uh, behind the back and it's not at all something that you would conventionally see in, in fencing or martial arts. But yet again, we can find precedent for it in some of the uh, treatises, it's sort of tangentially. I won't say that there's a block behind the back as such. So it's sort of slightly reminiscent of a small sword technique from Domenico Angelo's treatise of 1760. But not really, it's really quite different. And um, But I like it, okay, from a cinematic kind of flashy point of view. It does look really super cool. So there's an interesting uh, example there of, of force and of leverage. And the simple fact is if you strike down strongly with a two-handed sword against a person who's holding a smaller sword in one hand and probably is in a less advantaged position and is not as strong as you, then indeed you can what we call force through or break through their parry. But he's stopped. He's trying to subdue her. So I really, really like that detail. This shows that this was choreographed by somebody who understands how fighting should work or should look, but additionally they understand body mechanics and um, physics essentially. So that was really her final chance. He's giving her a final chance and unfortunately she didn't. She didn't take it, she didn't submit. She tried again to stab him with her dagger, which she's cut and stabbed him with several times by this point. And we should point out in real combat that would be really very foolhardy because of course any one of those cuts or stabs could nick an artery, could penetrate a uh, vital internal organ, puncture a lung, that kind of stuff. So very stupid to allow yourself to be stabbed in particular, but also cut. Nevertheless, he, he did allow that to happen because he was obviously quite determined to try and uh, subdue her and rather than kill her but in the end she gave up uh, her final chance at um, redemption. He allowed her to essentially stab herself with her own dagger. Again this is a technique we see in historical treatises um, particularly from the 15th and into the 16th century where a dagger is turned inwards and then forced in on the person themselves. So again a historically plausible technique and choreographed in a very precise and very beautiful way. So that was really nice. He essentially did a disarm there and you know it's it's in any martial arts from any time in any period of the world if someone attacks you with a weapon and you don't have a weapon one of your priorities if you can't run away and you have to fight is to try and neutralize that weapon number one and if you can get the weapon off them number two great because you've now revert you now turned the tables and massively increased your chance of survival so he does a pretty simple disarm there's nothing complicated here and i don't have any big problems with how it's done and it's interesting you know the guy is in armor uh, but he immobilizes the weapon and then he smacks him in the face which is a perfectly good thing to do so in that very first exchange, a couple of interesting things happens. He did two deflects, which I like. So attackers came towards him with a blow and instead of stopping them or trying to engage, he wants to stay mobile because there's multiple opponents. So nice detail with the halberd there and this top part of the halberd is very useful for catching uh, bladed weapons in. And in fact, if you're holding a long pole arm, it's one of the most useful bits d in defensive terms of the pole axe or, or halberd in this case. Most of what he's doing is standard kind of parry and riposte stuff. It's all good, very nicely choreographed. So a little detail here, there are two important things about outnumbered combat when swords are involved. Number one rule is try not to get surrounded. Well, it's too late for that, okay? Uh, but second rule is if you're surrounded, try and get back to back. And they seem to have done that. And I think most people know that it's a general fight advice. You know, you don't want to end up with opponents behind you. So if you've got a partner, then you put your backs towards each other and you fight outwards. And if you're moving around as they are in this scene, then you try and always make sure that you're both facing outwards. I've got to say, I hugely enjoyed 
enjoyed that fight. You know, melee is, you imagine the amount of choreography, the amount of training that went into making that scene. And it looks like a really convincing and fun uh, melee. Obviously not fun if it was real life, but uh, fun to watch um, a melee. And it gives a real feel for what a mass brawl would be like. The only detail I would perhaps change is I think there should have been a few more people who were wrestling, who were grappling, because usually when you have a big brawl like this, for anyone who's ever seen a real brawl break out in real life, most people end up rolling around on the floor and it looked a little bit too um, old school Hollywood. It looked a little bit too much. We're gonna fix our distance here and keep swinging at each other. There should have been more close, 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 and then people fall over on the ground and wrestle on the ground. Um, but apart from that, I absolutely loved it. So just a minor detail right at the beginning, I really love the fact that he's training her with a wooden sword. This is absolutely historically accurate. It really bugs the hell out of me where they have characters in a, a series or movie training with their actual sharp swords because this is the last thing you'd want to do. You know, you, you lovingly look after that sharp sword because the sharpness and durability of that sword is the difference between life and death to you in a real fight. So you 100% don't want to take a sharp sword and mash it up during training because you're going to just destroy the edges. It's also very dangerous. <laughs> so, you know, that famous scene training the hobbits to use their swords. The fact that they're actually just, you know, they could have just gone and picked up sticks, but the fact that they're using their sharp swords is horrible to watch. So I love the fact that they're using a wooden practice sword. <laughs> so there's a bit of a problem there because he's basically gone, look, copy me, but he's using a two-handed sword and he's given her a little gladius. I can see there's some firewood behind them right there. He could have gone and got a piece of wood that was a bit more similar to the sword that he's instructing with. If I'm teaching a longsword class, I don't give someone a gladius. Oh, passing footwork, that's nice. You strike from the right, you step with the right, you strike from the left, you step with the left. I love it that the stepping is all correct. It, it is completely in alignment with uh, medieval swordsmanship treatises. I also like the fact that Henry Cavill himself has got good edge alignment. Again, another thing that bugs the hell out of me is when I see people waving swords and their edges are not pointing in the right direction. He is tracking the blade nicely. He understands how to cut. Well done, Henry. <laughs> So I like this, they're training against a, a target, a straw man, absolutely solo training, learning how to administer your cuts and thrusts. Usually you would do this with some degree of footwork, moving in and out or lunging and recovering, passing footwork. She's a little bit static, but I understand this is a very close in shot. So if she was moving, they'd have to have a much wider shot, which wouldn't look as good. So I understand why they've done that for the filming process, but she's striking with the edge, that's good, uh, doing different cuts. Great. I love the fact that they've given the detail of she's obviously trying to rehearse one particular set of moves. Now, I'm not going to make a judgment on whether that set of moves makes sense because I don't know what the Witcher has taught her to do and what the purposes of it are. But we call this a form or a flourish or a kata and you find it in just most martial arts. And it's really great that they're showing this. I don't know whether most people would necessarily realize that that's what it is, but it's just a sequence of moves. And this is a very important training methodology and a very good way of getting a beginner to start to move at one with the weapon and like they're actually familiar with that weapon in their hands. So although it's a very fixed and prescribed set of moves that might not work out that way when you're faced with an opponent, the fact is that it's uh, teaching you how to move with the weapon. Very good. You need rest. Anything else we'll have diminishing returns? That's a really interesting detail, and I think a lot of people wouldn't notice that, but it's absolutely true. If you overtrain, you're more likely to strain things, and if you strain something, then you're gonna be out of training for the next few days, or you're just gonna keep exacerbating that problem. Most of us who've done martial arts for years are riddled with physical ailments. So great bit of training advice, don't overdo it. Recover, come back tomorrow, train again. Okay, so just first thing right off the bat to note is that this is in a pretty dark environment and it's, you know, with walls and doorways around. This changes everything about a fight. If you can't see clearly, then you have to fight in a very, very different way. And equally, if your space is very limited, you have to fight in a different way. 
<laughs> okay, I have to point out right at the first step. Basically, someone stepped into punching range, which is an incredibly stupid thing to do if you've got weapons. You know, one of the big things about weapons is they can reach further than a punch. So don't stand in punching range. Okay, I love the fact that he's using a chair. Um, absolutely, this is this is what you should do. Again, if the opponent's better armed than you or you're completely unarmed, then try and make yourself armed. The two obvious ways of doing this are either grabbing something that happens to be lying around, a chair, a table, a light fitting, whatever you can get, or try and grapple the opponent as quickly and aggressively as possible and get the weapon off them. So in an armed environment, if you're unarmed, make yourself armed. So there was a really nice, so the guy swings a, it's kind of a big knife or a short sword. And a really nice detail is that Witcher, Henry Cavill, closes in and intercepts the arm before it reaches the end of its strike. This is really good advice, okay? So you don't just stand there and wait for the weapon to get to you. Instead, it closing in and going into the arm before it generates its full sort of reach and, and potential of strike. That particular exchange was a good example of how to tackle someone who's swinging something at your head just good martial arts. I don't know if they were hinting at the use of some pressure points there, but he kind of attacks around the person's ear or side of the face. This is a technique we actually see in a treatise I teach from, which dates to 1410 by a guy called Fiore de Liberi, um, who wrote a book 600 years ago called Fior di Battaglia, which means the flower of battle. And it's fully illustrated with full text explaining all the techniques. And it has wrestling, dagger, sword in one hand, sword in two hand. It has armored fighting. It has fighting on horseback. It's a very complete treatise and it's one of the reasons that we've been working from it for 20 years. And one of the interesting details that they have in there, which it looks like they might have been inspired by that in this scene, is the use of the thumbs uh, and sometimes the fingers towards eyes, ears, and to turn a person's head. Now, turning a person's head is very, very important in any kind of grappling situation, usually done with the palm of the hand on the around the chin or jaw, but it can be done uh, anywhere around the eyes or ears. But turning the person's head breaks their strength in this direction. So he's grappled the dagger and by pushing the person's head around to the side, it makes it very difficult for that person to push back towards them because turning the head turns the spine. Okay, I seriously think that they've been studying Fury here because we actually see uh, Henry Cavill de defending with the um, dagger held out point down and almost laid along the underneath of the forearm. And again, this is straight out of Fury. You can find it in German treatises as well from the same period, the 15th century. But I absolutely 100% uh, know that this is not dissimilar to a technique where Fury actually shows in a last ditch scenario how you defend with a dagger against a sword. Now, clearly, you're kind of screwed with a dagger against the sword. But if that's all you've got, then it's better to fight than just to give up. So very interesting closing in techniques that are completely, I would say, backed up by, supported by, evidenced by 15th century European combat treatises. Toss a coin to your witcher, oh valley of plenty, oh valley of plenty, oh. So in my opinion, um, a lot of how the fight looks um, or, or in any kind of movie or show is down to number one, the choreographer, the fight director, but number two, who your actors are and how dedicated they are and what their natural inclinations and talents and even interests are. And it's very, very clear to me that Henry Cavill moves great. He's obviously interested. I know that he plays Warhammer, so I know he's interested in uh, medieval fantasy stuff and probably likes swords. I just get the feeling that he's really into it. And to me, it really shows because he moves naturally he's got great physicality I mean obviously he's got good build and is very fit but the way that he moves with the sword isn't clunky or heavy like a lot of people who've got his kind of physique can be great movement great choreography I'm pretty certain that they have taken a heavy dose of martial arts input and inspiration in forming these techniques and these scenes they look wonderful and honestly I think that they're way better way better to watch than any of the hand-to-hand -hand combat we've seen in, in any of the Star Wars stuff to date and I think that they're better than anything we've seen in any of the Lord of the Rings stuff that we've seen to date. I think they're doing a great great job and I have to say based on what I've seen today I think that season two the choreography the fighting looks better in season two than it did in season one and I think it was quite good in season one. For more of Matt Easton, make sure to check out our videos of him reacting to Hellish Cart or the original Star Wars trilogy. 